All right. Good morning, everyone, from uh, NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. Um, for remote participants, I'm Jesse Fyan. I'm the deputy director here at the laboratory. I'm honored to introduce today's speaker, speaker at uh, the Great Lakes Seminar Series, uh, sponsored by our Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research. Are we all good? Okay. Hang on just a second. Somebody said, I cannot hear you. Are we sharing? Testing, testing. Great. All right. Um, Sorry, let me say that once again. We have a number of remote participants uh, joining us today at today's Great Lakes Seminar Series um, here at uh, NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. This is sponsored by our Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research. So thank you so much for organizing um, today's uh, presentation. It's my honor to um, and privilege to introduce uh, today's speaker, Johannes Westerink, who I had the uh, privilege of working under while earning my PhD at the University of Notre Dame. So uh, presently, Johannes uh, is the uh, Ahern Professor of Computational Science and Engineering and the Massman Chair at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Earth Sciences at the University of Notre Dame. Um, Johannes, and I'm sure he will give an excellent presentation today covering this, focuses on the development of unstructured mesh coastal ocean models that really vary from a global to channel scale, highly heterogeneous approach. And um, uh, there'll be lots, I'm sure, lots of cool pictures about that. I, I hope you've got your traditional 200 slides in this, this uh, package here. Um, I'm sure it will be um, a very stimulating talk. Um, Johannes is the co-developer with Rick Ludic at uh, UNC Chapel Hill and Clint Dawson at UT Austin of the widely used ADSERC finite element uh, model. It's a, a shallow water model for the coastal ocean, um, really a community-based uh, hydrodynamic model with a wide range of applications used not only, in, not only in academia, but also in the private sector as well as in government um, heavily supported and widely used by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, Johanna, Johannes was a co-lead of the uh, Army Corps' interagency performance evaluation task force that evaluated the impacts of Hurricane Katrina using this modeling approach, um, as well as um, FEMA for um, coastal uh, flood mapping, as well as NOAA, and I can speak personally to that as I worked to uh, transition ADSERC into operations for um, coastal flood levels for both extratropical and tropical uh, storms. Um, and so ADSERC is at one of the operational uh, oceanographic models uh, run on the uh, National Weather Service operational supercomputing infrastructure. And um, there is a uh, operational models for both the East Coast and West Coast called the extratropical surge and tide operational forecast system, um, as well as the Gulf of Alaska. And there's new work in development, um, in part uh, going on here at Goral, coupling ADSERC with the sea ice model to look at surge, wave, uh, and, and the Wave Watch 3 model, I believe. Surge, wave, and ice forecasting for Western Alaska. Um, so um, there's ongoing partnership um, with Johannes uh, occurring with uh, between Segler and Goral. So it's a great um, opportunity for us to be able to hear from Johannes today about the latest developments in um, his talk, which is titled Towards Heterogeneous Process and Scale Coupling in Coastal Ocean and Floodplain Hydrodynamic Modeling. Johannes, thanks for joining us. All right, thanks, Jesse. So uh, what I'd like to 
give is a little bit of a fun overview of, of where we're headed and some of the work that we've been doing. And let's see. Okay, got it. Okay, so we, we're dealing with the coastal ocean and, and the adjacent floodplain, which, by the way, does include the Great Lakes. And um, really, when you start looking at all the, the uh, bins of different processes, you have tides, tsunamis, big uh, circulation that's very clinically driven, waves, storm surges, and, and rainfall runoff. And, and what's really interesting, I think, to think about is, is that all of those have, have been historically very binned. And not only bend in terms of the equations they use, but also in terms of the communities that develop them. And of course, we could get rid of all that binning by just stop solving the Navier-Stokes equations and uh, doing a little back of the envelope calculation that would involve 10 to the 34th unknowns. So for the global ocean, and not including the atmosphere, of course, which I exclude in this. And um, that the, the equations, foundational equations, were uh, developed by both Navier and Stokes in about 1822, so really not that long ago. And, uh, and by the way, I, I, I figure you can reasonably solve about 10 to 14 equations now, so we're still a long way off. And as a result, we've historically really binned everything into specialized equations and therefore specialized communities, starting off with uh, my personal hero, La, hero Laplace, uh, who uh, developed the shallow water equations, or the LTEs, Laplace tidal equations, in 1776. And you can do a great job with tides and, and an excellent job with uh, uh, storm surges because there was not a lot of vertical structure and even tsunamis uh, in, in large portions of the ocean. Then, in terms of dealing with the non-hydrostatic portion, uh, the Buzanesque equations were developed, but really uh, by Buzanesque in 1872, and uh, but pragmatically they were uh, developed by Peregrine in the uh, 60s. And you can do both nearshore waves and tsunamis really well. Um, in terms of wave forecasting, such as Wave Watch 3, you have uh, the spectral action balance equations of some sort, uh, whether that's uh, SWAN, Wave Watch 3, or WAM. Uh, those are all based on, on those equations, including you guys' model for the Great Lakes, uh, and uh, that was really developed in the, uh, conceptually developed in the late 50s by the French, and then put into practice by Hasselmann in the 80s. Um, then uh, rainfall runoff, the hydrologic models, kinematic wave equation, dynamic wave equation, and that was Light Hill in the 50s. And uh, of course that deals with the very thin layers of fluid that you're dealing with. And global ocean circulation being the last part of that solid hydro hydrologic uh, ocean uh, part uh, were developed uh, by Kirk Bryant in the uh, late 60s, and, and that's uh, the kind of the foundation and start of all the big global circulation models. And, and really, so when you think about it, it's process separation, it's uh, really limited domains typically, resolution separation, uh, there's within each bin there was a lot of nesting, uh, and, and then really to make up for a lot of the stuff that wasn't being caught because obviously all these processes are often interacting. There's a lot of data assimilation for the missing physics. And data assimilation, in my opinion, is great, but it really can push your solution uh, into wrong directions as well. So what I'd like to talk about a little now is the recent past, and that's our work with uh, Adcirc and Swan. Well, we coupled them, if you look at the spectrum over here, uh, you have the, uh, the uh, tidal component to it over here and uh, the long wave component, uh, storm surges, etc. You have the wave component, but I will point out that what's missing is the infragravity component and that, that can be important as well. So really what we're doing here is coupling uh, the uh, weather model, CFSV2 or climate model, GFS, whatever, to ADCERC and then there's a very extensively, extensive and well worked out coupling between ADCERC and SWAN, transfer momentum from uh, uh, breaking waves into ADCERC and informing the wave, waves what the water depth and the currents are. And, and there's lots of examples of that that we've run. Uh, this suite gets run uh, in part or fully like that uh, by the core, as Jesse said, NOAA, SFOS is, is run by FEMA as well as the NRC. And uh, we have had a long history with SWAN, 
the uh, parallel engine in SWAN actually is ad search. So that was funded through ONR. And, and there's a fairly clever system where we uh, run it on the same domain, same grids, and the interaction is predominantly in the same cores, which really helps speed up the uh, parallel processing. Um, we have switched over to WaveWatch 3 for a lot of our NOAA work, I should say, and, and especially because it has uh, the ice physics in it that was developed uh, a number of years ago and put in at NRL, uh, and that's really wonderful for our Alaska work. Um, domain decomposition is what we're driving it with right now. In that generation of a static, it's become dynamic, which really has helped. And, and this is a scaling curve on different kinds of port, uh, computers back about 10, 15 years ago. And at the time, we were scaling up to about 15,000 cores. So at CERC and SWAN together or separate, we're really, really highly scalable, which was, was very nice. Uh, typical example, typical grid uh, of the East Coast, Gulf Coast, and Caribbean. Uh, this study is focused here on uh, southern Louisiana and uh, a little bit of a zoom in over there of southern Louisiana. Uh, this is the region of Mississippi River, and you can see the, the whole delta there with its intricate web of waterways and channels and inlets, et cetera, and levees. And uh, so what we do is we lay on top of that the topo bathy with all the levee systems and, of course, this is the representation in Adsir called the Barrier Islands, where there's a lot of wave breaking. And of course, the, the, uh, the, the uh, ability of unstructured grids to, to resolve all that, this is the unstructured grid size, is just unsurpassed. And we've gotten pretty good at doing that, at, even at that time, about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and this goes from about 30 meters to about, I believe, 20 kilometers. Not representing this picture, this is about 30 meters, 40 meters to about a kilometer or so. Um, however, I will say that these grids at the time were grossly inefficient. And we've gotten a lot better at uh, basically targeting resolution and coming up with grids that are on the order of uh, uh, 10 times more efficient than these in terms of placing the nodes where we really need, need them. And we've worked actually surprisingly, I never thought we'd get into that, into grid generation uh, technologies and uh, there are, are, just by consolidating what's out there, we've come up with a very nice open source product called Ocean Mesh 2D. Anyway, to, to look at some typical results in that little corner is Hurricane Gustav. You can see the hurricane coming up over there. Uh, you can see 10 meter significant waves in the middle panel. These are the hurricane winds. And the storm surge is kind of uh, built up over here on the shallow shelf because it's trapped in this geometric structure over in here, and the hurricane is making landfall on the left panel over here. Um, the waves are, of course, breaking enormously um, as you go into the shallow waters, particularly over the barrier islands and near the bird's foot over here, putting a lot of radiation, wave radiation stresses on, and you have a continued buildup of storm surge over here and propagation of the uh, storm surge over the wetlands. And uh, here where the storm made landfall and the most intense winds are, uh, you have relatively small surge compared to here. Uh, so th those are the kinds of things we could do. So recent past, I'd summarized that unstructured grid development was really great, and it really was able to focus uh, localized resolution. Resolution got a lot better. The algorithms got a lot better, a lot dissipative, certainly when I started my career. Finite element methods were massively dissipated numerically. It was kind of embarrassing. Um, there's a lot better physics on the subgrid scale. Parallelism got really pretty pretty darn good. And, and we got the, the component interaction going. Uh, the bad is the, the grids were definitely suboptimal. Um, the, uh, the methodologies were at best second order, and often a lot of finite volume codes are lower order accurate than that, and that's really a shame. Um, the parallel processing wasn't necessarily most efficient. And you can say, well, gosh, it showed us that it was up, uh, scalable up to 15,000. But what I didn't say is a lot of that dry land uh, wasn't really being processed, but is in the grid and is being processed in the calculations, but it isn't really wetted, right? Only when the storm surge propagates over those very extensive floodplains. So we really need dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, domain decomposition. And, and the biggest thing really is to my opening kind of fun slides of, of the history 
it's still largely silo development with disparate communities. So I think the communities haven't really integrated well, um, as well as they could, and I think that's happening now, which is really, really, really nice. So to to uh, to that uh, in that path, um, we've uh, started working with HICOM, and so in the past the background water levels were always kind of slapped on ad hoc. You know, you certainly knew the seasonal variability, or you know the background water levels. There's some kludging in STOFs, which looks at water levels and kind of puts a, a coastal water level in the background. But really, it's the large-scale bericlinicity of the ocean that's driving background water levels, whether it's eddies, uh, currents like the Gulf Stream, et cetera. So we really need to get in the model. And we've, of course, run AdSearch 3D for these basins and bericlinically, and oh my goodness, it starts to cost a lot, right? If you start putting 40, 50, let alone 100 layers on, and uh, and you have those 30, 40 meter elements, uh, it just is prohibitively expensive. So uh, again, what we're trying to get, and this is a, a fairly simple case in Puerto Rico here, here's the mean average variability of sea level over a year, and this is more, if I had my reading glasses on, I could read it, but this is the Cato. And you look at that sea level fluctuation and, and you see that <coughs> both on a, on a 30 day mean as well as a shorter mean, and, and there's a lot of variability on top of the mean. And the mean certainly doesn't look exactly like that uh, mean average annual uh, sea level variability due to steric effect, due to potentially uh, big current systems, uh, whether it's the Gulf Stream or any other major current system, or whether it's eddies impinging or anything like that. <laughs> so here's this abstract simulation at San Juan. And uh, let me grab the water here. Um, here we've uh, averaged out, taken out the tidal signal. And, and what you see here is uh, that uh, certainly the fluctuations aren't being caught very well. But uh, more important over here on the on an annual cycle, this is a, a year-long run with the hurricane occurring here in September, Hurricane Maria. What you can see is this is the signal that AdSERC produces over the year. This is, a, I believe, a 30-day mean. And the actual measurement is over in here. So when the hurricane comes through, you can see an incredible depression. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And so we're really missing a lot of that signal that's being driven by the bericlinicity of the, of, the, of the ocean. Over here, when you do a, a, a power spectral density function, what you can see uh, is that there's a mismatch as well. So the blue is the adsorc signal, and the uh, <coughs> black is the actual measurement, the, the uh, NOAA station uh, in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And it's not just the very long uh, period, the annual scales that, that are, are incorrect. It's the much shorter shelf resonance scales over here. That's these are our shelf shelf waves that are oscillating there. And but it's also in the tidal range, which is right over here, in the mid mid portion. So we're missing a lot of energy there by missing their chronicity. The, uh, the 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 blue adsorc run is run with tides and. I believe CFS V2, and uh, simply the, the, the signals don't match up. So, okay, so you have, you have to get the bericlinicity in, and we've certainly worked with ROMS, and ROMS can do that, and ROMS does a wonderful job at it, and it can do so pretty economically. But, of course, what the trade-off is there, ROMS can't get you 30 meters of resolution in the near shore over all the detailed structures. So it's a trade-off whether you want the bare clinicity or whether you want the nearshore resolution. And I can tell you that the nearshore resolution and the inland resolution makes all the difference in terms of getting storm surge to propagate uh, in the nearshore and inland. So what we've done is uh, we've just used the standard dispersion terms and bare clinic pressure gradient terms that are already in ADSERC. And we said, well, instead of feeding them with AdSERC's own internal model, which is horrendously expensive, right, because of our resolution. We'll just go ahead and, and uh, go to HICOM in order to get that information. So uh, in this case, we're using DOS 3.1, but uh, the plan is that this is going to be integrated into 
uh, into GRTOS and NOAA's model, which is very similar to BOS. So a bare clinic pressure gradient, if you have the temperature field from HICOM and the salinity field, you can basically stick that right in, compute a density, compute the depth average bare clinic pressure gradient over in here, and feed that and force the same mechanism. So it's kind of like instead of having a homogeneous internal external mode model, which is integrated in one model, here we have a heterogeneous one and we say, hey, uh, NOAA and the Navy are already running HICOM, why not just use their forecasts and, and downscale that information onto our grid and compute that bare clinic pressure gradient and the, uh, the momentum dispersion terms which we can compute because we can just look at their vertical velocity profiles. In addition, uh, when you get to this larger scales, internal tidal dissipation, internal tides become very important and we can compute parameterized dissipation by knowing the, uh, the uh, density field as well. So really, it's a clever and uh, cheap uh, uh, coupling of, of two different scale models but getting the information that we need. And so we, we slapped it onto this grid. This is, by the way, generated by our ocean mesh generator. Can generate a grid like this in a matter of a couple of hours. And uh, it probably goes from about 30 meters or so to uh, about uh, 30 kilometers. And uh, I guess eight kilometers to match ICOM down to 30 meters along the coast. And, and there's a lot of structure, both in terms of shelf breaks as well as in reef systems that requires high resolution in order to get accurate answers and accurate wave simulations. So the setup is CFS uh, V2 uh, hourly winds over the year, 2017 in this case, uh, Gauss 3.1 from the Navy uh, forcing the bariclinicity. And, and again, all we're doing is pulling the temperature and salinity fields from them. And, uh, and we'll go ahead and, and make the comparison. By the way, we do run a, uh, um, a sponge forcing layer here and here, and uh, basically I, I, I absolutely hate boundary conditions. Boundary conditions have been the bane of my existence, so I'd like to get rid of them forever. And, um, and so these are the results. So over here you can see the bare trophic at CERC running. Yeah, you have a lot of nice pressure, low and high pressure systems bouncing around. Uh, this is without tides, by the way. You have water being pushed up along the coast, which is definitely a, a very important part of the signal, but over here you can see the effect of the Gulf Stream and seasonal, interseasonal variability, et cetera, and this is what the ocean really looks like. And, and in fact, that is a much truer representation of water levels in the ocean, and that's being driven by these current systems. So currents up on the shelf, of course, uh, where, where you have all the weather events making a really big difference, but to the right is the very clinically forced through the bare, uh, bare clinic pressure gradient term uh, current patterns that you can see in the Western Atlantic and in uh, here a little bit in South America. And you can see the Gulf Stream very nicely over here. So that's actually geostrophically pulling the water away from, from, the, uh, from the coast. And, and so getting that variability is, is just huge. And so now we go back to Puerto Rico and, and look at Puerto Rico for a little bit. And um, again, this is all of 2017 uh, at different scales. This is uh, just around Hurricane Maria. And you can see Irma and Maria there. And uh, this is filtered. And talk about a couple of the aspects over here. This is the 30-day mean water level at um, St. Croix Virgin Islands. And you can see the barotropic uh, adsorc right over here. And you can see the bariclinic adsorc here in red. And the black is the uh, the NOAA measurement. So we're getting a great representation of that. And then you look at HICOM, uh, it gets it pretty well too, but not as well as we do because we've got that extra coast, a lot of extra coastal resolution. HICOM is eight kilometers in the near shore. We're down to 30 meters over there. So we're actually getting extra bang for the buck there uh, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, getting that feature. Now, if you look at the power spectral density function, you can see that for the most part, the new ADSERC, their clinically driven ADSERC run, captures all the energy. So we weren't capturing that all uh, with, uh, with the blue run, it was way too low. And even in here, where you have these shelf resonant waves over on the very high end of the spectrum, 
in around 5, 10, 15 minutes, uh, we're capturing those features much better as well. So really, from we were capturing the energy in the ocean much, much better. Now here's the interesting thing in terms of Post Maria. We kind of uh, hit our heads a little bit and, and looked at why the uh, NOAA gauges all sunk south down over in here post Hurricane Maria, and it's even more uh, visible in San, at the San Juan gauge. Uh, it turns out that there's a huge amount of cold water upwelling during Maria, and that brought lots and lots of cold water near the coast of Puerto Rico because there's a big uh, uh, eddy sitting on, at the coast, and that basically, with the hurricane, that pulled that water away from the coast during the hurricane and basically brought up cold water there. And so we've got that uh, wonderful bear, bear clinicity pulling um, uh, the warm water, or at least the warm water being pulled away, and then uh, cold water upwelling uh, taking its place. So if you look very carefully, the red curve very closely matches that, that event because it was driven correctly by the high con temperature and salinity fields. And, and of course, we weren't capturing that at all. And HICOM was way over-representing that effect. So we, we have a much better match, again, due to that better coastal resolution. And the same is, is true over here at, uh, um, at San Juan. And again, uh, you can see the red curve much better matches the NOAA, sig measured NOAA signal than, than the, uh, the HICOM does. The uh, ADSERC by itself, without the air clinic uh, pressure gradient term being forced, doesn't capture it at all. And again, the same is true for the spectral density function um, across uh, across the whole frequency range for 2017. I think there's a little bit of a mismatch here. We really should probably be doing a two-year run in order to capture that annual uh, signal there. So all the, uh, the air skill parameters vastly improve uh, in terms of root mean squared, gamma squared, and, and the skill coefficient, basically the uh, almost exclusively uh, except at one or two stations, and this is across a whole range of stations, the, uh, the skill parameters improve dramatically. So um, in this journey, basically we said, okay, we really don't want to deal with uh, um, boundary conditions, and uh, our, our uh, sponge uh, radiation uh, generation type boundary conditions do a really great job for wave models. Uh, we've used them extensively for that. They do a great job for tides. We can sit right on top of an amphibian growing point. Uh, they, they, they mine both the uh, elevation and, and uh, uh, velocity information from a larger model, and uh, but they do a really crappy job at, at uh, allowing that Gulf Stream to propagate out of the domain because there's so much, uh, so much variability in the exact structure of the eddies that we almost inevitably have mismatches, which is why we moved it way to the north and south instead of using our east coast. So we became pretty convinced that we wanted to rid ourselves of the, uh, of the pain of, of boundary conditions forever, so we, we said, well, we'll just reformulate AdCERC and go ahead and do a, uh, a global model with it. So uh, we, we moved out of the, uh, the uh, regional and went to the global domain. And so we had to do a little bit of reformulation. If you look at the continuity equation that I'll focus on over in here, this was actually a troublesome nonlinear term because you have the cosine phi embedded here and the cosine phi over here. Uh, when I originally wrote the, uh, the code, I, I did a little bit of a scaling analysis. I expanded out the, uh, uh, this term in the continuity equation, uh, the gradient of the horizontal flux, essentially, if you call it. And, and I said, hey, tan phi over r, VH, you can, you know, fairly well show that it, it should be fairly small. And um, when you go to the global model, that certainly, that assumption goes out the door. Now, you can say, well, let's just go ahead and keep the other terms, by the way, that we neglected at the time were, are fine. They're, they're very, almost always very small and don't make much of a difference. This term, however, was that was not the case for the global model when we reformulated. And, uh, and so uh, we had to take care of it. Now, the problem is that it makes the equations very stiff if you just plunk it in like that, and uh, you get uh, very unstable behavior. So uh, we, we had to, to fix that, that correction.
Right, right. Five minute elements, yeah. So we have to, because we use equal order interpolants in, in AdCERC, we actually have to reformulate our uh, shallow water equations into what's called the generalized wave continuity equation. So we actually form a wave equation that substitutes for a continuity equation. So we combine the, shell, the continuity and momentum equations, we time differentiate the uh, continuity equation, and then, and then we uh, differentiate the momentum equations, and we merge them together so that you actually have a second derivative in time and a second derivative in space. So it truly looks like a wave equation. And, and that's what we do, and, and that's why, why we had to manipulate this in order to get it to all work well. And so, yeah. Sure. Um, so anyway, I won't spend too much time with it, but um, we, we had traditionally used CPP, transformation of the sphere to the, to the uh, um, to a rectilinear system, which is used in ADSERC, and we expanded to that to equal area, CPP, uh, which is an equidistant, and a Mercator type projection, so we included all three. But uh, what really uh, made, made everything work just beautifully was we multiplied the equation through by cosine to the P, where the P is defined depending on the projection you use, uh, phi, um, and, and then uh, you, you basically reformulate, and the pertinent variable in the wave, this wave equation becomes zeta cosine to the P phi. So you really reformulate, that keeps all the terms intact, uh, now we don't have the nasty nonlinearity anymore that we were dealing with, and, and it all works just beautifully. So just by a little bit of clever manipulation. And the most important thing, in the property of the equations is not stiff, so we get really beautifully robust and stable answers. So just to take a, a little bit of a look there, we have the global mesh, uh, and uh, here, or one of them, and again, we can pop these out with our mesh generator in a matter of uh, 10, 15 minutes, and uh, we, we slapped on SRTM v2, plus uh, version 2 on this, and uh, then actually uh, you know, YEPCO 2019 with a Canadian data set called NONA, um, and NONA 100 is 100 meter set. It's an absolute blessing in our lives when we got it, uh, and it's used in GEPCO. Here's the element mesh sizes, which is a little bit tricky because uh, we, we actually you can see a lot of near shore, but, but the bottom line is it's, this is a fairly coarse grid. It's a 30 kilometer grid, goes down to two kilometers near shore, and, and uh, we do capture some of the shelf breaks and shelves over there. The mid Atlantic ridge is not highly resolved in this. Uh, we usually do, do that, but uh, we're doing a little bit of trickiness here because we're computing the uh, topographic gradients, which are used in the internal tide terms. Uh, we're computing those on the original DM, so a little bit of, of trickery there to keep the cost low. Um, so anyway, this is a, a solution for the M2 amplitude, beautiful structure, uh, particularly around the Atlantic, uh, lots of amphidromic points. Uh, you can see our, our Alaska project has some huge tides over there, uh, etc. But uh, this is a very, very close uh, signal to what we should be getting. Uh, in um, now, if we, we uh, go ahead and match up and compare to TPXO9 Atlas, which is a very good representation of the tides in the deep ocean and the outer shelf, not so much the near shore, uh, but, but in, in, on the ocean, the, the actual water surface elevation is absolutely, you can't beat it. It's data assimilated with very, very high precision with the TPXO satellite data. So. Uh, what you see there is horrendous results, right? Uh, the, the, this is the response function on the order of a meter. This is the error. Uh, the, the red spots are on the order of 20 centimeters. And this is the legacy excerpt before we made the correction. And so uh, the spherical correction that I just kind of reviewed and blew through all those equations, which uh, I obviously probably shouldn't have even thrown in. But <laughs> the... Uh, but now we, we make the corrected version of AdCERC and we get this. So all of a sudden, okay, we're pretty happy. We did the right thing now. We've got the right equations. We didn't neglect anything and kind of a little embarrassed that we left them on in the first place years ago. But that was okay for the spherical model, uh, but for regional models. But you do see now that uh, we still have some hotspots. And 
by golly, where we have a big NOAA project doing the East Coast, and uh, uh, the idea is eventually to pop this. These are very high resolution, very detailed, but very economical East Coast model wants to be, for the SDOS model, probably wants to be popped into this global shell. And you can see that the global shell is doing a terrible job over in here. So we played around with the bathymetry a little bit and went to GEBCO and this NONA 100 data set from our friends in Canada and take a look, all of a sudden the response gets much better. The problems go away. So uh, overall, if you start looking at the error statistics, they, they're starting to look really, really good. So the bottom line is, what was the big difference? The big difference was the bathymetry in Hudson Bay. And so that made a huge amount of difference. And if you look at uh, a very old paper, Egbert and Ray from 2000 in Nature, um, they, they quantified based on TPXO data all the top dissipation sites on the Earth and take a look what's number one is Hudson Bay. So what our plan is to go ahead and, and resolve Hudson Bay and, and some of the other dissipation spots, the European Shelf, et cetera, just in a very targeted way. Instead of using two kilometers there, we'll probably go down to about 500 meters and use the best bathymetric data sets that we can get our hands on to, to go ahead and improve that dissipation picture. Because of course you can't do global tides if you're not pulling out the energy correctly with dissipation. And I, I should say we do do, obviously, internal tide dissipation uh, quite well, which is about 30% of the global total. But if you're not getting those spots right, then, then you're not there. So the good is we're, we're advancing heterogeneous model integration, interleafing, uh, and really getting components to interact better. Uh, we're, we're getting better and better at targeted resolution. I think we're really doing great. What I didn't talk about is our high order algorithms. With discontinuous Galerkin, we're generating a whole new family of codes doing that. The bad is that the grids at this point were still largely static and costly to generate, although Ocean Mesh 2D has made a huge difference in there. The physics is static, where we have to predetermine it. We're, we're still not doing as well in what I've told you so far in the load balancing. And uh, a, gen a general problem that faces us all is that we're uh, our, our peak processor performance is going, going, getting smaller and smaller and smaller on, on today's generation of computers. So we're not pulling out as much as we can from, from the codes and from the chips. So what's the vision? Really a fully dynamic computations that really change and evolve to what's needed. So that would suggest that, hey, the physics should change on the fly depending on where you're at and what you're doing. And, and I'll get into that a little bit. Grid resolution obviously should change. So that's H adaptivity. And, and we've been working at, on it as well as many, many others for a long time. The order of the interpolants should change. We should, just should not be using simple linear interpolants and in codes like these. We need to be much more clever about it. And also the whole thing should really dynamically load balance and change how it's assigning workloads to, to cores. So, I'll talk a little bit about developing frameworks that allow this dynamic and coupled physics, uh, dynamic grid optimization for the multi-physics, uh, high order methods, and advancing uh, engines for load balancing. So first off, under our, our um, project that we're partnering with you guys, we're not only coupling HICOM, but we're also going to be, because in Alaska that is quite important, there's a, uh, our major current systems on the bearing shelf that go north and south. Uh, we're coupling, obviously, the sea ice. We're also on another NOAA project coupling for the East Coast, coupling to WARF, WARF Hydro specifically. And we're, we're looking at uh, non-hydrostatic uh, shallow water equations. So a whole bunch of things going on there. <coughs> a lot of this stuff is getting coupled through uh, coupling AdCERC, WaveWatch 3, HICOM, and sea ice. It's going to be ultimately coupled through ESMF and WAPSI. And uh, maybe uh, take a look at a couple of the components. So within AdCERC, we now have the ability to do non-hydrostatic components. Uh, and um, basically, we do it through a pressure Poisson solver and green nag the expansions of the, relative, uh, of the relevant equations. And basically, we have to solve one uh, additional equation, which then feeds into a, a non-hydrostatic pressure gradient term in the shallow water equations. Long and short of it is, is that we can now do infragravity waves. And, and just kind of a, a fun little video, this is Hurricane Haiyan, and uh, you would say, well, a hurricane's not supposed to behave this way, it looks like the, well, or 
uh, Phil said it's a, a typhoon, and um, the uh, but uh, this is uh, footage taken in the Philippines. And what you can see there is something that looks like a, a tsunami, but it's a, it's a typhoon or hurricane, and uh, that is the infragravity portion of the spectrum. So, uh, and, and so obviously it's just fine to do a, a shallow water equation there most of the time until those infragravity waves kick up. So what we can do with discontinuous Galerkin is we can actually uh, customize the physics for each individual element. The physics is written for the element, not for the whole domain. And so, for example, we could just choose to do shallow water equations in most of the elements and then add the pressure Poisson solver for selected elements where that is going to be important. And that's very, uh, very relevant to both tsunami modeling and this infragravity waves. We've tested it extensively. We've got about five to six papers on it. This is work uh, that's uh, in collaboration and uh, on, the, on the pressure Poisson solver led by Andrew Kennedy at Notre Dame. And, and we do really, really well on, uh, in getting all kinds of signals that are non-hydrostatic. Next up is uh, uh, to look at the Warp Hydro. This is a project that we're doing for NOAA as well as uh, NSF pre-events. And uh, so we can actually get clever and customize the physics even further. So as the elements go further inland, for example, we might want to use a dynamic wave equation uh, or the kinematic wave equation, which are the equations used in hydrology. So instead of trying to squeeze uh, shallow water equations to do the job there, which is horrendously difficult, I um, speak from experience, uh, we, we customize to the correct type of equations to getting gravity-driven overland flow. And, and so that works a lot better. And we can do that dynamically and select in real time what, what kind of equation we need. For example, maybe as the, the uh, um, flooding front, um, the inundation front propagates in further, we just go ahead and switch those to shallow water equation versus uh, this one might still be kinematic wave equation. So we can really do this. Uh, we're really, really pushing hard to implement this whole concept of dynamic physics. Also, we can uh, choose the order of the interpolants. We've been messing with this for a long time. Uh, Ethan Kabatko, one of my students at Ohio State, plays with this a lot. And uh, we can essentially uh, the idea is not only to use higher order elements because you can use fewer of them, but when you need to get additional resolution, you can use higher order interpolants, quadratics, cubics, etc., on those elements to get a lot more detail in there. And, and this is a nice little representation rendering of just the bathymetry with a high resolution grid, a, uh, a low resolution grid with third order interpolants, and then that same low order interpolant. No, low, low order, poor coarse resolution grid with the low order interpolant. Obviously, the bathymetry is not very well represented over here. This matches this quite well, and that's true for the hydrodynamic response as well. Um, so, essentially, the next step then is to do dynamic H adaptation and fit more elements into these uh, these coarser elements. We can do that as well, and we've got codes versions of our DG test codes that do that. And the idea is you only add extra resolution when you really need it. And again, that's very, very nice. We've been looking a lot at what it takes to do all kinds of storms and tides correctly. Here's Hudson Bay, or, or sorry, New York Bay and the Hudson River uh, um, Valley that's been inundated. This is at low resolution. This is at high resolution. Turns out it makes a big difference in the response of New York Harbor during a storm like Sandy because it turns out that there's actually a backflow where water is being pushed in actively into New York Harbor. This acts as a, a backflow valve that pushes water out the front door. So here are the grids that represent that. Uh, we've come a long way with dynamic regridding with the Ocean Mesh uh, 2D software that, uh, that we're developing. Um, so last uh, little component here, I think we're rapidly running Am I running out of time, Jesse? Or? Okay. All right. So uh, dynamic load balancing. Uh, traditional way that AdCirc was run uh, was there was a lot of dry nodes all the time, and uh, but those dry nodes were treated exactly the same as the wet nodes. 
So uh, what we've done is we have been playing with a uh, uh, product called Sultan uh, together with MPI. Um, uh, Sultan is from Sandia National Labs, and we had an NSF project uh, to basically develop HPX in order to dynamically load balance those. Uh, the idea is that, uh, for example, uh, you get uh, the uh, standard discretization and domain decomposition would put a lot more uh, subdomains into the high resolution uh, shoreline area, which typically tend to be uh, more highly resolved, and you would have much fewer wet domains. Most of these are fully dry. Uh, they're racking up all the computational costs, but not really doing anything aside from computing zeros equal to zero. So this is a much uh, more balanced calculation. It does involve some of the memory trade-offs as well. You don't want to overload a core too much on memory, but uh, this actually crams in the cores now in the actively wet region and therefore runs substantially faster uh, and really pretty much to the proportion with a little bit of overhead uh, that it costs to only run active wet regions. And so that's been a big boon and, and we're pursuing that particular technology uh, in, in a much bigger way. Um, we, we are going to a different load balance, dynamic load balancers, uh, with partners through an NSF uh, uh, pre-events grant uh, with the University of Illinois. Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll finish with uh, um, a couple of slides here. So in, in the past, it was really not only siloed system, but it was a very one-way path in terms of how you did models. You had the physical system, developed the grids, you had your equations that you decided on, you formulated and laid that into your code. Um, you had the, uh, the differential equations, the, method, the discretization methodology for us, FEM, HPC. Um, by the way, this is uh, Seymour Cray, Boris Galerkin, and Laplace, our, our lab heroes. And, um, and then you got a response, and that was it. Anyway, so I think the, the right way to go as we develop so much more information, including measurement data, is to have the models look like this. And, and that is that there's these two-way streets. It's not just a one-way street, but there's this dynamic interface between the response, between the physics, um, between the model, uh, between what the grid looks like and the original geophysical system. So it's this massive uh, back and forth. In, in, for example, am I going to put on uh, the, uh, the uh, non-hydrostatic component with pressure Poisson solver, when do I do that? How do I put it on? How do I go from kinematic wave to dynamic wave to shallow water equations, et cetera? What kind of resolution do I need at, one, at, at, one, at any one time? Do I up the P? Do I, uh, in terms of the order of the interpolant, or do I provide more resolution in the grid? So all those things need to be asked, and then they need to be actively managed through some kind of dynamic uh, uh, meshes, but also through dynamic load balancing on the HPX or Zoltan side of the family, or we're, we're moving to uh, uh, a version of uh, Charm++ Plus Plus with our Illinois partners uh, as a more, uh, an easier way to do that. So that's, uh, that's what I certainly hope the, uh, the future looks like. And I think that's it. on okay uh, in order for the remote participants to hear us we'll use the microphone for questions um, yes we have questions over here yeah this is a great uh, lecture and I have uh, seen in uh, course modeling uh, have been the cutting edge and in the frontier of the research and I admire you have been in this develop your own model all the way for the last, last uh, a few decades and up to now. Unlike, unlike uh, in American society, many people just for, pursue palm, rob, and then avica. So in this, your own things and develop, I think, very quick. My question is here is, uh, and can, uh, can your uh, white drawing uh, te technique 
-hmm. conserve energy and math. So, um, so the uh, wetting and drying is uh, using thin film technology, right? Mm -hmm. Which uh, a lot of the models use. Uh, we um, and they they're not perfect. And uh, which, by the way, I look at the physics of the wet dry front as being kind of transitional, right? You're just trying to get yourself from uh, a fully uh, pressurized physics to nothing being there. So in, in the sense that uh, wet, wetting and drying is uh, using thin films is imperfect. Um, you know, we, we do a good job and, and we do basically conserve mass on, on a large scale, not a local scale, but on a large scale we certainly do. Uh, we, we actually are um, in, in our community looking at uh, something that was initiated by Kasuli in, uh, about 20 years ago or so, and, and that is really looking at uh, wetting and drying as a coarse media problem, and this integrates very well with the subgrid scale as well. So, uh, Andrew Kennedy and uh, one of my former students at NC State, Casey Dietrich, and uh, a couple of guys from my lab are working on this this uh, porous subgrid scale element. And, and that actually allows for subgrid scale connectivity between, for example, meter scale channels, because I think it's still going to be decades we could, before we ever could, on a large scale model, resolve that. But it also uh, essentially allows us to put, and we're using this for, uh, for NSF work, to put, uh, put water um, at that subscale. It works really well with the kinematic wave, and that is, that is 100. That is uh, 100 percent uh, mass conserving. So that that's the direction we're going. So right now, I'd say that the current ad circ is a little bit transitional um, in terms of getting us there. Globally, it conserves mass just fine, and, and we always check that. Uh, but that the uh, future solution is is this subgrid scale technology. Uh, Delft uh, Delft 3D um, has that built into it, and. and uh, Bruce Delling at Delft uh, worked with that quite a bit um, and, and initiated from the Thank you. Uh, one more uh, question. Uh, in your interleaving technique, mm -hmm. and what is the uh, physics behind the uh, uh, velocity dispersion? So it's uh, basically it's the uh, depth average velocity minus the actual velocity, vertical velocity as a function of z, right? And then when you develop the uh, depth average equations and you you integrate that over the vertical, um, that that becomes a dispersion term. So it's the it's the actual physical dispersivity by going over to a shallow water equation. So it's it's not the it's an addition to the diffusivity term, and so we call it the uh, dispersivity. But it's basically it's the u hat where u hat is the difference between the depth average velocity. And the uh, um, the actual z velocity, right? And then integrated, and then because it comes from the uh, convective terms or vector acceleration terms, it's what? Yeah, Correct. that's that's exactly right. And and before that, we just parameterized that, right? So now we're actually computing the actual values. Yeah. If anybody uh, who's participating remotely, because I saw we had over 30 participants, has a question, go ahead and type those in. Um, are there any other questions here in the room? Thanks. Um, so if I understood the selective physics approach that you're talking about, like the cell-based um, physics selection, so as, I guess I'm picturing that as a, as you move water inland, like during some flooding event, you would, you would change the, that physics as it moves up. Um, is that something that's predetermined, or is that like a conditional, like a depth-based? That would be a depth-based. So that right. would be done on the fly. So okay. let so let's say um, a storm surge is propagating in, water level is going up, it's flooding the overland region. Let's say in a real simple case, you have a nice overland region that um, is uh, where, where it's raining, right, and it's moving water towards the water body. And so the appropriate equation might be the kinematic wave equation, right? As that that's moving uh, 
uh, moving along. So you're just dumping water that's just simply gravity driven uh, in very, very thin layer over into your water body. However, when that pressure rises, right, when that, when the, the, the storm surge moves in and starts flooding the inland region, then certainly it would be appropriate to use shallow water equations for that element. So we'd look at the, the water levels there and, and just flip over to full shallow water equations. And, and because uh, discontinuous Galerkin is really, in a nutshell, it's a finite element method on a specific element instead of the whole domain of elements, which standard finite element, standard Galerkin is, and, and you actually communicate between elements through a Riemann solver and flux type condition. And, uh, and so you can do that beautifully that way because it really doesn't matter as much anymore what the physics is as long as they're moving the right whatever to the adjacent element through, through the fluxes in Riemann solver. So it's, by the way, DG is kind of at this happy path of uh, every community that's clever steals ideas from another. Right? And it's essentially a kind of finite volume, except you, have, you can have higher order interpolants inside of the element and instead of getting the derivatives by looking on a whole cluster of external elements, you do it inside. So it steals the best from finite, uh, finite volume and uh, in terms of the Riemann solver and that concept, but then it uh, basically doesn't have the mess of trying to compute higher order derivatives with a, a, a stencil of elements of, I should I guess, uh, the points outside of the element. Thank you. We have a question. Okay, uh, John Warner has questions. Uh, one is, how does add circ depth average to deal with return flow at depth during uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, with respect to that Hudson Shelf Valley feature that you talked about? So uh, that basically uh, is handled very nicely with, uh, so it's not the Hudson Valley flow is still depth integrated, but it's returning even though the stresses are working against it. Because if you look at shallow water equations, because the depth is so much greater, all of a sudden the, the uh, wind stress divided by uh, rho capital H, which is the total depth, the balance changes in the Hudson River uh, valley because I think the depth is something like um, three or four times or three times what the adjacent shelf depth is, right? And so the stress works very differently with the, uh, uh, in terms of balancing the surface elevation gradient, right, which works over most of the domain, but doesn't work over the Hudson River Valley. So that therefore allows the return current. So you really don't need the vertical structure to capture that. And, and also, uh, um, we're, we're always focused on the inner shelf, and certainly during big storm events uh, that uh, we, we would uh, uh, think that you would have, because of the wave action, pretty, pretty vigorous vertical mixing. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, Follow-up to that, uh, can, you, well, can you talk a little bit more about that ocean mesh 2D product that you reference in terms of grid generation. So yeah, that's uh, so actually that originated, it, it wasn't called Ocean Mesh 2D, I forgot what it's called. So it's a triangulation algorithm that is uh, um, a force balance in, uh, based on force balances on the nodes. And that's how it triangulates. And so we've evolved that with a lot of, of uh, specification of, of target functions for topographic gradients, for all kinds of, for putting in channels. So for example, in our East Coast work for NOAA, we're going to great lengths to identifying channel networks within estuarine systems. So if you look at Chesapeake, for example, there's a lot of deep channels. Traditional wavelength to delta X, and even when you put in topographic length scale, uh, would, would provide very coarse resolution in, in the major hydraulic conveyances or the residual channels such as, for example, that Hudson River Canyon, and not put higher resolution, but lower resolution there. So we've put all that kind of functionality into it, and, and even crests, et cetera, and all the things that we think are going to be important. Um, obviously, uh, uh, 
the uh, topographic link skills in there, but lots and lots of other functions as well. And, and so it's, it's based on a triangulation algorithm uh, that was developed in MIT, very popular paper. One of my, uh, Ethan Gabatko at Ohio State uh, messed with it. We picked it up and added a lot of functionality. It's on GitHub. Um, it's on our, our, there's a link to it on our uh, coast.nd.edu. Um, it's open source. Anybody's welcome to grab it. I know that uh, NOS, uh, the uh, uh, Coast Survey Development Lab, their, their folks have been uh, using it to develop global grids, et cetera. And, and so it's, it's very much under development, uh, but it's uh, open to use, it's, it's fun to use, and it's free to use. And, um, you know, it, it really targets resolution better. Uh, than, than uh, the way we did it for years and years using SMS. The other thing I will say that because of the force balance algorithm, the, uh, the grids are inherently more stable for highly advective flows. So if you get a lot of advection, it was always biting our fingernails. And for some reason, the uh, force balance, if you control the expansion rates correctly, does a wonderful job. And, and so, uh, again, you can just uh, Google even GitHub, uh, um, Ocean Mesh 2D, and, and it'll lead you right to it. Um, great. Um, one last question. Um, I think it's related to that. Um, what aspects did you include in this new mesh relative to, you know, existing AdSert mesh meshes? So maybe, you know, how did how how have the mesh meshes changed? Um, so yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, so we we've done a lot of things. So um, so one. A big partner project with NOS and NSEP is uh, to develop this new East Coast SDOS grid and hook it into hydrology as well as the Bear Clinic forcing. Um, but obviously, that's going to be an operational mesh. And uh, so we wanted to go from the SDOS mesh, which was 250 meters at the coast, to I forgot what it was in deep ocean, to something that went down to 30, 40 meters to catch a lot more of the nooks and crannies. And, uh, and so, for example, uh, we, we have implemented a lot of uh, what's called medial axis uh, uh, technology. Technology it's uh, uh, stolen directly from uh, imaging uh, type of uh, science, and uh, it, it defines uh, basically the angles, etc., and computes distances across channels and what have you. Is the way we're using it, um, and so what that allows us to do is have a variable slider resolution along the coast. So traditional methodology might be say, hey, I'm just gonna put 30 meters at the coast. Uh, here we can actually have a sliding scale, 30 to 250 meters at the coast, 250 being the minimum because we don't think that we get good wave current interaction below that, or if we have a coarser. So we, we can uh, generate grids that actually have um, only when there's intricate structures that are of the scale that we want to look at, uh, or intricate narrowing of a channel, for example, that will get down to that 30 meters and then go up to, to 250 meters. So we have a lot of technology built in for that. As I said, very important, I've come to believe that if you can get the major conveyances right into systems and get those high resolution, uh, then then you're gonna get a lot better, better flows on that. So that Ocean Mesh 2D does all those kinds of things. And we already have a couple papers out on it, but uh, we're, we're, as we're evolving these new East Coast uh, meshes for NOAA, we'll have a bunch more. And again, uh, it's all available, and we're free, we're happy to share it with folks. Great, thank you. Thank you for answering all the questions. What, you have one more? Quick, quick, what one? Great presentation. Thank you very much. So, with all the improvement in the uh, domain decomposition and dynamic load balancing. When are we going to see running coupled assert with wetting and drying plus weight and ice at a time step above two seconds? Ah, so <laughs> yeah, this has been very much on our minds. <laughs> and uh, so, of course, the, the one uh, end of the uh, cracker to, to bite at is, uh, is optimizing the discretization, right? And now, on the other hand, we have this global shell which, by the way, our partners at, at NOS really love, right, because they can put all the SDOS models right into one shell instead of having to run seven models. Pray to God that the uh, boundary conditions don't pick up on you in an operational environment, et cetera. 
So we're adding about a million notes for that global shelf. But um, we, uh, we, we kind of scratched our head and said, hey, we're, we're implicit, so we really shouldn't have that. We shouldn't have a current-based stability limit. So we uh, played a little bit with um, looking back at the, the weighting parameters in the uh, generalized wave continuity equation. And, and we, we since reconvinced ourselves that we can actually retune those, get equally accurate implicit results, and actually take much larger slime steps. So we actually have an operational global model ourselves for, uh, for storms. Uh, and again, you can just go to coast.me.edu. We do uh, four times a day. Were written by, uh, driven by GFS uh, FV2, and, um, and and now it is on the global scale yet. We're building localized high-resolution insets to those that'll be dynamic, by the way. So there'll be dynamic insets that get placed into the coarse resolution grid when we detect that a storm surge is going to happen there. But bottom line is, I think we run that at something like 30 seconds, 40 seconds, something like that. So. Uh, very, very large time steps, so we can beef that up. The other thing we're doing, playing with, is elongated elements in the channel systems uh, for two reasons. First of all, uh, you know, that uh, we can actually um, beef up the time step because the current number is predominantly controlled by the, the, uh, the actual distance in which the flow is occurring. Uh, and second of all, that we don't need to use as small an adjacent uh, find an element on the floodplain. So we can triangulate on the floodplain, but we can do it if we, let's say, have a three to one ratio, we can do that uh, much cheaper. I, I will uh, confess that uh, our, our clever Dutch friends that do Del 3D um, use that kind of approach. Although, I will say that their finite element know-how is nowhere near the American know-how. Uh, being a Dutchman, I can say that, but uh, and, and, and they don't do high performance computing as well either. So. Uh, thank you very much for all the excellent questions. And uh, Johannes, thank you very much for an excellent and very stimulating presentation. Johannes has been very uh, generous to stay with us for the afternoon. And we'll, we've had, we have a number of meetings scheduled with the IPMF modeling team to go over some of the work we're doing, so we'll look forward to some of that interaction. Well, thanks, for first of all, for inviting me, and um, it's kind of funny that I've been in the Midwest for 29 years, and I, I've, this is the first time I've been here, but of course I've interacted very sensibly uh, way back uh, from 25 or so years ago with Dave Schwab. I had a very uh, good interaction with a lot of times. So, oh, that's so thanks for inviting me. We're glad to have you. Ayumi was actually, uh, we should uh, thank Ayumi for organizing yeah. everything. I should say that uh, Ayumi and I are on the same project for Alaska, and that's been a really great interaction. Getting the, uh, the sea ice knowledge and the ice knowledge that you guys bring, it's just wonderful. Thank you. So thank you very much. There is a, a dinner planned for this evening at Sava, so if anybody would like to join, please see Ayumi um, for that, uh, to get on the uh, reservation list. And otherwise, um, we'll let you continue about your day, and, and thank you much for attending the seminar.